So let's get on with the first session now. And uh, we welcome on stage the following panelists, Dr. B Sebastian Maurstra, Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Jamila Mahmud, who is online, Professor Tan Cho Chuan, and His Excellency Suryo Pratomo. Mr. Sean Xiao is the moderator for international collaboration and partnerships. Good afternoon, Deputy Prime Minister, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. There are many things we still don't know about the virus. It's mutating as we speak. Uh, one thing's for sure, the virus doesn't know boundaries. It doesn't distinguish between continents, borders, nationalities, or ethnicities. The truth is that no one is safe till everyone is safe. How do we fight against such a virus? We must surely rely on collaboration and partnerships is what the Deputy Prime Minister talked about. It appears that many people are convinced of this. Uh, let's look at a survey I'll begin with, uh, a Pew Research Center survey published last August. I'd like to call up slide one. It looked at 14 countries and how the people actually view international cooperation. Let's have slide one. Okay, there it goes. Overall, 59% of respondents believe greater international cooperation would have reduced the number of coronavirus cases in their own country. In Europe, the average increases to 62%. There's an outlier right at the bottom, Denmark. If there are Danes out there in the audience, love to hear your views after the session. Uh, just, I'll just leave it there just for you to just look at the, um, the survey. Okay, so does the reality bear this out? This belief that international cooperation would have reduced the cases back home. So what do we intend to do in this panel is to attempt a report card on that. And from that report card, draw lessons for disease acts. As someone once said, you never want a serious crisis to go wasted. Now we started with a quick poll around the panel uh, to get a scoring from one to 10. 10 is the perfect score. If you're a teacher, how would you rate international collaboration? And within a minute as well, why do you give the score that you gave? Let's start with Ambassador. Uh, my answer is the score is seven because uh, uh, the last 10 months, we realized that uh, we cannot be safely uh, for ourselves. It will be ping pong as long as any other country is left behind. So the last 10 years, we learned that how important that we are collaboration. In the first, maybe many countries is more selfish, but no, everybody, every country is help each other. And hopefully, the vaccine, the DPM already mentioned that the most important thing that how the availability of the vaccine and how to make all the countries can get the vaccine. Thank you, that's a score seven. Dr. Jamila, you're calling in from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, you can hear us well. What's your score? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go for a generous five. Uh, I say that because I completely agree with His Excellency, the Deputy Prime Minister. The Independent Review Board has also shown that when we started uh, with the pandemic, the multilateral uh, cooperation wasn't really optimal. And this is a huge disappointment because we knew that the pandemic was uh, inevitable. It was a question of when and not if. And yet we are always caught by surprise. I think part of the reason as well is that you know, we need to ensure that we depoliticize the international system, especially the World Health Organization at the beginning of, of the crisis. 
And we need to vest authority in the UN uh, for its mandate, as this is really one of the biggest peace and security issues of our time. I think that I give it a five because I see uh, I'm an optimist. So, uh, you know, you start with five, you don't fail them. But there's so much room for improvement. International collaboration has been great, but there's still a long way to go on real multi multilateralism. I like your comment about being an optimist and giving a five score. <laughs> I like to <laughs> do that to my kids. All right. Uh, from Singapore, Dr. Uh, Professor Tan Cho Chuan. So as an academic, I'll say uh, it's a four with a wide dispersion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, let me explain. Uh, I think if you look at the science collaboration, the information exchange, it's very good. A seven or eight, I would say. It works very well. If you look at the public health response, uh, some things worked a lot better this time around, but I would say that uh, there's been a general failure in uh, coordinating a global response to the pandemic. It's always easy to look back uh, with hindsight, but if you imagine when the pandemic first started and the countries in most affected were doing all the best to contain it, and if everybody else did their part to prevent transmission from taking root, then you would have a circumscribed pandemic. It would just be an outbreak in the region. But because Everybody else didn't do that. Uh, when the regions were first affected, recovered, other people started getting outbreaks. And then you had a desynchronized, a globally desynchronized outbreak, which uh, now leads to a situation which is extremely hard to contain. And the final point I want to make is that this is actually a pandemic in the full glare of a social media era. Mm. And uh, I think more could have been done to manage the types of misinformation, disinformation that has actually uh, complicated very greatly the public health and societal response to the pandemic. So on a weighted average with a wide dispersion, four. <laughs> ah, okay, all right. Uh, Dr. Mora Stroh? Um, I, I would say the more on the optimistic side, uh, I shared uh, the seven as a score. And uh, of course, I, I, I referred uh, a lot to the uh, open sharing of genome data. Uh, which is one, one of the, the in interesting uh, facets that, that was possible. But I also understand uh, all the, the limitations and the, in the response and uh, everything can be improved. Hmm. That's good. A, a mix of bulls and bears. Yes. Okay, um, genome sequencing, we talked a bit about that in uh, Deputy Prime Ministers. We heard that. And you just mentioned it. Let's start with that. The scientific cooperation uh, to handle and tackle uh, COVID-19. For this promise, we won't go technical. My last lab outing was like more than three decades ago, but it's difficult to avoid uh, mentioning some key multilateral players. And I'll call up slide two here. Uh, it's an alphabet soup of acronyms, but it's just a primer on the screen because uh, these names will be raised along the way. You see Gazade, uh, which is the the one in blue. Um, just over a year, a year ago, this very platform was where the first fully sequenced genomes of the virus were made public to any scientist with an internet connection. Dr. Morris Rowe, you're a scientist, uh, and ASAR is deeply involved in this. Could you tell us the significance of that first uploading of the, uh, the, the sequence to Gizgate? Gizgate? Well, I think it's a good example that uh, the international sharing uh, works even across the different countries. And uh, I have to emphasize that this was not just sharing of a, a single sequence. It was multiple sequences that were shared by Chinese CDC and uh, other labs that were of high quality that were uh, ready for scientists to be used. And um, uh, one important aspect, and uh, we have a, a little slide on that. Um, Do you want to call it up? Uh, yes, please. You, you can actually learn a lot from having a, a genome. It can be part of the response. And uh, it starts with designing your uh, diagnostic kits in the first place. Um, you can see which existing drugs are already working. You can also use AI and repurpose drugs. Uh, of course, the start of uh, creating vaccines was exactly when those genomes were shared, uh, including for the, the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, for example. Uh, at the same time, for public health response, you can use it for helping contact tracing. You can see the global spread, where which uh, virus has come from, which continent, from which country. Uh, and you can see if there is a cluster. And you can see if your, your uh, containment measures are successful that a certain cluster stopped. And uh, you constantly need to watch out for these new variants, and it's very uh, much in the news right now. And um, this brings us back to the very beginning, because you need to understand the virus naturally changes. And then you need to possibly update the detection kits. You need to see if the vaccine still works. And uh, that's why, actually, it's not just the first genome. It's a constant sharing of genomes. 
And it's very important that this is not done just by one country or uh, by few countries, but globally. That is very important. Why were countries so willing to share the information? It's a platform, but it takes two hands to clap for people to want to make use of it. Yeah, so uh, that, that is part of the great success story. Uh, Gisei, that uh, started with Avian Influenza uh, many years back, uh, took on the task to uh, also help with sharing the coronavirus genome. And uh, it's been quite a, a remarkable uh, sharing experience. Um, uh, from the Singapore side, together with many teams around the world, we have supported this effort. And uh, uh, we also look at the quality of the genomes. And maybe if we can look at the next slide, and I'm not gonna give a scientific talk here, it's just to illustrate for you, this is the, the rise of genomes that Gizit has received from around the world. Uh, I show here the, the slide that was uh, summarizing the whole last year. And uh, you see the, the spread, 143 countries, so by now it's over 145. And uh, today the number of genomes actually is 396,000. And uh, it keeps flowing and it's a, a very good experience for international cooperation. And uh, you can also see early on there, there was uh, some trend and you can also see for ASEAN, which is very important here for us in the region, that also the, the partners, it's not Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia alone, almost all ASEAN states uh, contributed. But it's also uh, visible that uh, the, the strong countries here are able to contribute, and this is important for surveillance. Mm. So what's the status right now? Is there any fatigue that's been setting in? And obviously it's mutating right now. So the, the burst was good, the burst of energy. What is it looking now? I, I think um, it's important to know that uh, one can always improve. So there are some countries that continue contributing a lot of sequences and some contributed some to show that they have the capability, but it's very important for our, this uh, system to work, to know that the diagnostic kits work, that the vaccine is effective, that we have a continuous surveillance. And this is why, uh, um, the, the, the team that operates this and uh, many scientists, uh, there are a lot of people to help. So there, the system will be running and running, but we need all the countries to continue contributing. Uh, with that effort and uh, additional uh, uh, sequences, we hopefully can understand better how the, the virus uh, jumps around as, as was described like a ping ponging between countries. And the emphasis really must be the international cooperation because uh, uh, Securing one country is not enough. You have to uh, uh, eradicate or control it in as many countries as possible. Uh, Tony, maybe if I can just interject, I, I would say that uh, in general, uh, science has become really international. And so for uh, you know, many years now, since before the pandemic, uh, scientists uh, work across many, many countries and collaborations. Uh, uh, postdocs, uh, students study, they go to many countries. And so there are these uh, very well-established uh, networks uh, that have been cooperating on many, many fronts. And I think what this pandemic has done has uh, really accelerated and pushed forward uh, this whole idea of how data sharing and the scientific collaboration across borders is so critical uh, to find solutions. And I suspect that it's going to lead to a new infection point mm. where uh, it will rebase the uh, expectations for the extent of scientific collaboration uh, across the world uh, for future pandemics, but also in other areas outside of pandemics. Dr. Jamila, would you like to chime in? Would yes, uh, yes, indeed. I, I completely concur because I think on the science part, uh, science diplomacy, collaboration, innovation, we've been really seeing a lot of traction. But I come back to the very notion of multilateralism, and that is about you know governments aligning towards a common goal. Uh, despite the fact that a COVAX facility was built, we, we have seen the reluctance of some major donors and major countries not wanting to participate. We've seen now vaccine nationalism still rear its ugly head. And you know I just saw data that only 25 people from developing world have been vaccinated. So, um, and this is why I think, you know, we've got to look at multilateralism across the spectrum, right? From the political will to, you know, policies. And then of course, science is the much more uh, easier thing to tackle because uh, basically it's very technical. It's experts who already have networks inbuilt. But I want to go back to the multilateralism in terms of ASEAN. I think ASEAN has an amazing opportunity here. I really hope that there will be a lot of learning documented. 
and also the opportunities to look into, you know, I've been mooting the idea of an ASEAN CDC, so to speak, that helps us look at, you know, low cost solutions for the region and also look at, you know, pooling our resources and ideas around innovation. I can't imagine why we can't have a mechanism that if the ASEAN uh, sort of block uh, you know, endorses a certain vaccine or gives it uh, approval that the other countries in ASEAN, you know, can actually take that uh, as a, a regional sort of agreement. So I think there's so much more room for, for improvement on the multilateral side. Do you think the um, internationally COVAX is having, uh, facing quite a bit of headwinds? Do you think it will be a lot easier at the ASEAN level? Because the countries are pretty disparate in terms of development as well. I think we need to try. Uh, I think that COVID has given us a, a, a massive dress rehearsal for the future. So, you know, yes, there are. But, you know, I, would, I will remind all of us that ASEAN is the emerging economy in the world. Uh, so no doubt there's disparate economies at the moment. The potential for ASEAN uh, to grow and to become stronger is there. Of course, we have to get over the terrible economic consequences of the pandemic right now. But we need to start looking at a systems approach to the region. How do we address this? I want to go back to the very fundamental of the pandemic. This is not a health crisis that emerged on its own. This emerged because we, in the Anthropocene age, have really violated our planetary boundaries. We have, you know, had massive urbanization, destruction of environment, you know, the release of zoonotic diseases is not something that happens spontaneously. There's a disconnect between looking at sustainable development goals, the climate uh, agenda, the uh, health agenda. There has to be, you know, us bringing it together and what I foresee is the next big move and that is planetary health and that you know until and unless we have these conversations that are linked then we will forever be looking at things from one point of view and not having a holistic approach to how we prevent how we address how we uh, anticipate and how do we then be able to be resilient and adaptable in, in combating future crises. So I hope Singapore will really lead in this. You know, I, I think we need an Asia Pacific Planetary Health Center, if not a global one. Uh, Asia is the disaster supermarket, so to speak, you know, and as well as many pandemics starting from this region. We have to lead now. I, I, I challenge all of us that we are a region that needs to lead. Okay. I think it's interesting to sound uh, in the, from the ASEAN perspective. The leaders uh, uh, at the last uh, ASEAN summit have already agreed to set up what we call ASEAN Center for uh, Public Health for Emerging, emerging. and Emerging uh, Diseases. I think this is the idea is come out from the leaders that ASEAN is must be uh, thinking as a one and how to uh, uh, respond if we have uh, the next pandemic. So I think this is the, 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 the one thing that uh, ASEAN um, have moved forward and thinking about the, for the next uh, diseases. And the Indonesia itself have already proposed to become the host for the ASEAN uh, Center for Public Health. That term. I think I'm fully agreed with Dr. Jamila that how the ASEAN is most must be more uh, co make a cooperation and for the experience the Indonesia so on, I think uh, uh, Ekman Institute uh, have a very close cooperation with the ASTAR to develop about the diagnostic for the COVID-19 test. So it's the example that actually in, in, in ASEAN we have made a lot of cooperation. Indonesia in Tamasek Foundation, I think the partnership between Indonesia in, in, uh, in the Tamasek Foundation is very, very good. I just uh, two months in Singapore, and most of our job in the last two months is how to make a connecting with the, our colleague from Tamasek. And many things that we have done in the, in the field that once, uh, for the example, for digital tracing, we cooperate with the Tamasek Foundation. No, we borrow uh, at least 500 uh, token of blue pass and we starting to implementing and make a trial in the task force office in Jakarta. So once is, uh, I think this is the one of the example that the collaboration in ASEAN is already. 
Mr. Son, if I may, I think um, the question is not um, should we be uh, country level, regional level, or global? In fact, you need all three. You need multiple layers of defense. And uh, in a large country, you need actually coordination within the country. And then if different regions coordinated better, then you'd have less moving parts. But you also need a super layer of a global uh, cooperation because some things, frankly, can only be managed at the global level. Uh, and uh, in relation to COVAX, I don't know whether you want to talk about it now. Uh, it is uh, a ship that's being built as being sailed uh, because uh, it started off with uh, uh, Gavi, uh, which procured for uh, countries that receive uh, um, uh, uh, donated um, uh, types of vaccines. But also, uh, now we have uh, self-financing countries, countries, high-income countries coming together. And uh, this is unprecedented. And the rules are being developed uh, as we are going along. So uh, in a way, our expectation for COVAX uh, might not be that it delivers vaccines on day one together with all the rich countries. I think we have to uh, compare with the historical norm where the low income countries will be far, far behind. If COVAX is able to deliver it uh, faster and in much greater quantities, and by doing so, bring the acute phase of the pandemic to an end faster, then I think it would have made a huge contribution. And the successes of uh, COVAX building on what has been built now I think then we'll be able to refine it so that it will be able to respond in a much faster uh, and a much coordinated manner. I mean, today we are just, uh, we are just working out the rules. How I appreciate to do it, this. Uh, work in progress. Yeah. I just want to call up this slide, which I've prepared anyway. It's a slide three, and uh, it uh, goes exactly uh, aligned to what you're talking about. Uh, the theory is good. The, 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 the construct is fabulous. No one would dispute an equitable distribution and access uh, for all countries to vaccines. But the truth is actually something else in terms of um, how some countries are hoarding, some countries have actually opted out of COVAX. And you did talk about, yeah, we need to fix some things. What are these things that we need to fix right now? Because you're really closely in involved in the COVAX discussions. I think the first, uh, uh, the first set of things is uh, to procure together, mm. uh, which means that uh, you have to decide on which are the candidates which are uh, uh, promising and how to make advanced procurements and to uh, have a mechanism to do at risk financing. And I think that's uh, uh, largely in place, uh, needs to be built out. And then after that, it's really uh, getting the doses and delivering them. Uh, that's the part that uh, I think the expectation is for it to occur much faster. Uh, but the reality, I think it was going to lag a bit. But there's uh, an element of COVAX that is still being discussed, which is the exchange mechanism, meaning that. Uh, there will be countries around the world that have uh, far too many vaccine doses. Mm. Uh, some countries have uh, doses five times. Uh, <laughs> three to five times in excess of what they need. And uh, COVAX could potentially be a, a multilateral platform that allows uh, an exchange to occur, which then uh, enhances access of uh, countries that have not had access so far. Uh, so this is still being discussed. It's not, um, it's not been developed yet. But I uh, think it's uh, part of uh, the solutioning that's occurring at the multilateral platform level at a global, uh, uh, looking at global scenarios. And uh, the more such effective tools that we have at a multilateral level, then the better prepared we'll be uh, for future pandemics. And I think it will still make a contribution for the current pandemic. Uh, mindful of the time, uh, please send in your questions for those, uh, whether you're watching us on streaming or whether you're in the audience here. There is a question that's come up here uh, in terms of lessons to be shared. It's great to share good lessons. What about the bad lessons? Uh, how willing are countries in terms of bearing their warts and all to tell you, we've gone wrong here, don't, don't go down that path? What do you think of... Uh, that sort of uh, rising above all you, the, um, the, 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 the insecurities or the nationalism to actually share information in a very, very open way. What do you think, Ambassador? I think, uh, once again, all the countries uh, now is realized that COVID-19 we must call as the disease of tomorrow. Nobody knows about what kind of uh, the virus 
and how we can uh, uh, handle it. Uh, I, I want to the experience of Indonesia beginning when we uh, founded the COVID uh, case and outbreak has happened in, in Indonesia. Uh, the first cases is announced is 2nd of March. And after that, the WHO uh, called the pandemic status all. And then the president, uh, Joko Widodo, is uh, set up the task force of COVID-19 on 13th of March. And the first week, I still remember, because I'm a member of the task force uh, COVID-19 in Indonesia. The first week of the, 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 the after the president set up the, uh, the task force, nine medical doctors in Indonesia is passed away. The most of them is not because they are treat the patient who have infected the COVID-19. Four of them is a dentist. This is the example that the COVID-19 is the, 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 the new diseases that we don't know exactly what kind of this virus. So that's why for the Indonesia, I think Indonesia is open its willingness to cooperate and to share about and knowing about what is really happened and how that we can be respond about this uh, the, the virus. So I think uh, the, the, the proposal and now the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia have already elected as a co-chair for the COVAX. This is the, the, the show that the Indonesia is still open and no barrier at all to cooperate and also the sh share the, the data about the COVID-19. Okay, want to go beyond the science, we've got like 20 minutes left of the discussion into supply chains. We've seen the shortages of masks, PPEs, uh, sanitizers. We're not even going to talk about toilet paper shortages. But a lot of it's born out of export bans, interdiction, self-interest, really. How do we do better for the next pandemic? Any opening up to all, any one of you, just jump in. I know there's an idea of ASEAN stockpiling, but please, by all means, uh, throw in the ideas. Uh, maybe uh, uh, kick the, you know, start the ball rolling. I, I think that uh, the best time to uh, deal with the pandemic is right at the beginning. So we know that, and it's uh, really uh, amply demonstrated by COVID. And uh, in order to uh, respond early and with sufficient intensity, uh, it requires preparedness. And uh, preparedness... Um, the level of preparedness at the country level, at the global level. And uh, what you've seen in COVID, of course, is that this uh, varied greatly around the world. And uh, I think that what would really help in terms of mitigating supply chain impact um, and enhancing the public health response in the future is uh, to elevate the preparedness level at country level, at regional level, and at the global level. And at global level, we also have to provide uh, for countries which don't have the capacity to have uh, in-depth defense. In other words, uh, uh, stockpiles, experts, uh, emergency financing, the ability to deploy resources in, uh, in uh, areas where uh, the capacity does not exist. Uh, so if we uh, could do this um, much more effectively, uh, I think we'll have a much better chance at the next pandemic uh, to try to uh, contain it when it's beginning. That is the most difficult period because uh, you worry about uh, overreacting. But once the pandemic gets to the level uh, where uh, countries are in a somewhat desperate situation, then it's, it's really very hard mm. at that point to uh, then try to find mitigating uh, uh, solutions. Dr. Mo? Uh, very important to learn from what has worked and uh, we, we can reflect that actually over the, the previous experiences from 2009 or 2003 SARS there are a lot of improvements but the experiences can be different for example in 2003 uh, sequencing was not so common it took two months for the first genome to, uh, to become available in the database and now we can do this in days and um, uh, what has also happened is because of this technology, many countries around the world have the capability, but they also need the supplies for doing that. And the same supplies in the case of RNA extraction is one of the, the steps that is needed, both for most of the diagnostic uh, kits, as well as uh, for the sequencing, there was a shortage of it. And uh, uh, it's really a logistic distribution problem. 
um, where are, are those places? And having uh, a structure where uh, there is a global connectivity, but including regional centers that have enough uh, uh, available to distribute to their countries, maybe one of the solutions. Uh, for the DC6 and looking forward in the future, we need to be aware if there are technological changes that we follow that pace so that we are prepared for that new technology that will be applied then. Uh, we don't have holes in the supply chain. We didn't expect uh, shortages of reagents, yeah. did we? <laughs> okay, Dr. Jamila, do you have a view out of yeah. PL? I, I, as someone who's worked in crisis for more than two decades, preparedness is, is key. And I think with this crisis, we have a real opportunity. Uh, the United Nations, the international organizations have humanitarian response depots all over the world. And I think what we need to do is look at how do public health emergencies, uh, preparedness, link with other humanitarian crises and therefore what needs to be positioned, your inventory list, you know, and all that. But I want to maybe put a little bit of spotlight on something else. When we were in our mad scramble to get PPEs, disposable masks, and so on and so forth, I think we never uh, thought about the environmental impact of the things we used. And I think we will be dealing with another crisis of you know, all these disposables that are going to end up in the sea. So I think at this point in reflection and moving forward, we need to think about how we push industries to be much more environmental friendly in preparing uh, you know, stocks that are required in large scale crises like this. But may I just turn back to something? Let's do a reality check. The reality check is that it's very, very much community-based. The virus starts and the disease starts in the communities. The solutions must also come from communities. And where pandemics have been managed well, and I've been involved in Ebola and all that in West Africa, is when communities themselves participate because behavioral change is the key to ending pandemics. Uh, this is you know, something that I think has, we have to learn a lot about. And, um, and on your question about, you know, will countries share failure? I think Sweden was very courageous to say that, you know, their approach to herd immunity was not the right one. Uh, and I think that, you know, we learn best from sometimes the failures that we make. So I think I would encourage that we have, you know, honest conversations as part of the learning, learning process. Mm. Thank you. There's a question now. I'll just uh, sort of take a different tack now and um, talk a bit about recovery. I know we're staring at surges right now. It's a bit difficult to think about recovery. But as we recover, this question goes, how can the international community collaborate in post-pandemic recovery? For example, transboundary supply chains, travel bubbles. And I do have a question on travel bubbles to supplement, to add on to that as well. Right now, we're seeing a patchwork of rules, regulations, quarantines, even, uh, you know, in terms of how you prove you've got that vaccination or the PCR test. Is this what it is that we've got to contend with? Uh, rules, different countries, and at different times, the rules could change as well. Is there a way we could do better in terms of encouraging the reopening of borders? Uh, Ambassador, would you like to have a go with that? Son, once again, uh, one thing that we must understand that the carrier of the COVID, uh, virus of COVID-19 is not animal. The carrier is people. Once the people is let their freedom go everywhere, it will be dangerous, especially because so many asymptomatic uh, people, it can be uh, infected the other. So I think what the Singaporeans have already done, especially to control the foreigners to coming and 14 days. I think the good things to want to get to protect Singapore. That's why uh, we're trying to, 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 to not to, to take the lesson learned from Singapore. Maybe Indonesia is different, it's too huge. But once again, uh, we have already discussing with the head of the task force Indonesia, possibility to put more uh, smaller in the island, for example, for the Bintan. Uh, once we can have uh, control the Bintan, and like Singapore, we can implement how the way to, to handle uh, the contagious between the people. I think the travel bubble is po could be possible to implement, it, not from Singapore to Indonesia, but Singapore to Batam. That's one example. But once again, I think 
Now is the most important thing is how to control the contagious. Because once again, comparing to the uh, SARS, I think uh, COVID-19 is less fatal. But the contagious is more, more fast comparing to the SARS. So this is the very dangerous, the, 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 the contagious. So the, the content of the people who infected is, I think, is more important. Bilateral. And what about at the international travel? Is there a case for greater harmonization? Uh, I think the conversations should start um, concurrently at different levels. Uh, but the reality is that the time frames of the resolution will, take, will be very different uh, for a couple of reasons. The first reason is we are having a desynchronized pandemic. And the countries that are severely affected now, uh, their priority must be to contain uh, the, the, the serious spread and to bring new case numbers down to a level where uh, control through contact tracing quarantine becomes feasible. Uh, you, you need to get to that baseline uh, because otherwise it's very, very hard uh, to um, contemplate uh, a very serious reopening or, or reconnection. On the other hand, uh, countries which uh, are already containing or uh, are on the way to containing the outbreaks, I think are in a better position to start to develop travel bubbles, uh, trade reopening, uh, re-engagement. And uh, so I think we need to have conversations at the different levels. It would be ideal to have greater standardization, uh, which is evidence-informed, in terms of uh, testing regimes for travel, quarantine requirements, what to do with vaccinated people. Eventually, you would need to have a unified standard. But uh, practically, we should expect that the initial uh, cooperation will be amongst uh, countries, like-minded countries, who have a similar pandemic situation. And uh, perhaps there could be opportunities for the learnings from those earlier engagements uh, to be taken up uh, at a more global level. Thank you. Dr. Jamila? Yes, I, I completely agree with that because I think at the end of the day, borders are under sovereign control and, you know, each each country will want to ensure that it protects its citizens and it is one of the requisites of, you know, even WHO standards as, you know, managing your borders as a, as a requisite. Um, I, I fear, though, you know, I must be honest, that, you know, if, if we come to a time where, say, there is a travel passport, uh, will we be having uh, unequal sort of opportunities for the developing world to actually travel? Because again, linked to the vaccines, uh, availability, equity distribution, and so on and so forth. So I, I completely agree. It's really work in progress. It has to be uh, similarly, uh, you know, similar circumstances that different countries are facing that might have to experiment within that realm before we can actually look at a much more uh, you know, global approach. But maybe region by re regionally, we can start already experimenting and looking at uh, you know, some mechanisms that might work. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I've got questions coming in. We've got five more minutes. Please send in your questions. There's a question on ASEAN uh, from Lin Tan. Uh, how can ASEAN's potential be emphasized for a true ASEAN solution? to COVID-19 and future crisis, how can ASEAN nations be incentivized to cooperate rather than prioritize their own interests first? Um, I, I think uh, there is a hotspot uh, interface between animals and humans where new diseases can emerge. So if we have to be prepared that new diseases will come. And uh, exactly the area uh, where it can emerge, uh, a lot of um, uh, effort can be put in. And uh, uh, in order to allow this to happen, and uh, it's capability building, but also it requires trusted uh, mechanisms to share the findings. Uh, Gizet originally was founded uh, also in the, the terms of the avian influenza crisis. And Indonesia was one of the countries that uh, shared freely through Gizet uh, this data. And this is because uh, they, they, they trusted the, the system that uh, also the uh, information will not be taken by, by other people, by big countries. And, and use for, for their own purposes. So with the confidence that uh, uh, as a region here, uh, we trust each other and the mechanism itself is uh, uh, sustainable for global sharing, uh, I, I think there, there is a great potential to be tackling uh, also future diseases. All right. Yeah, I think um, that um, on the research side, there's uh, a lot of scope for us to do more. Uh, I think Sebastian mentioned a very important one, which is uh, 
the interface between people and animals, where people and animals mix very, very freely. Uh, that's where the next uh, uh, epidemic uh, is likely to come from. But also in the area of uh, clinical trials, um, we, uh, I, I just like two brief examples. Uh, we look at uh, trials of uh, therapeutic agents. And uh, you know, we, uh, uh, if one country like Singapore has lower number of cases, but there are uh, many cases in another country in ASEAN, then uh, by cooperating, we can actually advance the trials much faster. And then uh, all of us can uh, benefit from the fruits of the discoveries. Uh, so clinical trials uh, would be an important area where I think we could do even more work together. Uh, the other example I'll give is environmental transmission. Because uh, how do we uh, develop the evidence base to judge uh, how much we need to do uh, in terms of uh, uh, mask wearing, uh, density in a room, uh, social distance, etc.? Uh, it would be good for us to derive data on transmission potential. And uh, so in Singapore, we actually have been starting to do that, but we ran out of cases to uh, carry out the studies on. Uh, it would actually be uh, very ideal if we were able to work with uh, our regional partners in order to advance these studies. And that data would then be useful for everybody because it can then help us to calibrate uh, the different types of uh, safe management measures we put in place and to understand the relative value of the different things that we do. It reminds us uh, when we ran our cases, Tomasic is actually right now partnering Indonesian and Philippine hospitals uh, to test and validate uh, the, the various tests that we've got. Uh, any last uh, thoughts on this matter around the table in terms of ASEAN uh, cooperation or collaboration? I, 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 three I, minutes. I think with the, what the Dr. Jamila mentioned previously about the community for her experience in Africa, I think also in the COVID-19 uh, cases experience that the most important thing is how to the educate the people because the, uh, we think about the high, in high level co collaboration, but as long as the in community we can uh, give the enough uh, education, I think it's very dangerous. For, once again, for the Indonesian example, uh, uh, we're trying to uh, to educate the people and how the way to to uh, bring the people more understand is we learn from the New Zealand uh, experience how the media uh, can take a role to not only blaming and complaining but media is have a role to educate the people how to uh, avoid to impact the COVID-19 once you uh, have infected what you must do. So New Zealand is a, a very excellent, especially for the media. The role of the media is very important. So that's why from the Indonesian uh, uh, experience, uh, me, I'm, because I'm uh, experienced as the journalist, first that I must, uh, that, that, that I'm doing when I'm joined with the, uh, the task force is how to bring the mainstream media, not only once again to complaining, but how to to educate the people. Fortunately, for of time, no 891 uh, main, um, uh, mainstream media from television, radio, printing media, online media, no supported the government to educate the people. I think the most important thing that the Ibu Dr. Jamila have already mentioned, how the, we teach and to educate the communi uh, community. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> OK. Uh, any last questions in the room itself? Oh, Dr. Jamila, you want to? Yeah, please join us. Yeah, on your question on ASEAN, you know, ASEAN has great aspirations. One ASEAN, one response, prosper thy neighbor. It needs to now, you know, basically crudely put, you know, put your money where your mouth is, right? I mean, basically what happens in ASEAN is that we think of great uh, institutions and build system, uh, these, these things. I love the idea of AFID the ASEAN uh, Public Health in Emergencies and Emerging Diseases. But we've got to look at the sustainability of the, centers, of the centers. And therefore, there has to be a commitment from ASEAN member states to actually fund uh, systems, establishments that actually benefit the greater good. ASEAN is a region of 
you know, uh, is it six, uh, 600, 300 million people yes. uh, and, uh, uh, and a, a tr three trillion economy, 600 million people, a three trillion economy. I think we've got to really invest in the region. I think uh, I am a complete uh, multilateralist, globalist, but I also feel that the the world has evolved so fast and changed so fast and disruptions affect different regions, different countries and different contexts in different ways. So we need to be much more diversified in finding solutions as well. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists. Uh, we're running out of time, half a minute more. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your insights on uh, science, uh, co collaborations, supply chains. ASEAN Planetary Health, uh, wish you all the best. Yeah. While COVID-19 has been a wake-up call, it's also shown us that we can work together. And so I just want to uh, thank the audience as well for your contributions and for listening. Thank you. Thank you.